the last 20 odd years working in the realm of customer data, whether that's in um, insight analysis, so actually delivering uh, insights to clients, you know, through standing up and presenting to them and or sharing dashboards, Excel workbooks, all that kind of thing. Um, then some time working in the UX realm. So a lot of the sort of user centric design uh, stuff, some of you may be familiar with, and I'll cover a little bit in this uh, session as well, um, working on designing data products. So whether that be dashboards or our sort of big global data tools that um, deliver insights to clients, people are able to run reports and so on. Um, so I've spent some time uh, designing those, but more recently, um, doing this sort of information design consultancy work that I do um, and just being a general champion and um, uh, super passionate about the world of data visualization and, and insight communication. So what am I going to be talking about today? First off, um, I'll just do a little bit of a re refresher or it might be new to some of you about um, why is it that we even visualize data at all? What's the, you know, the power of data visualization? Um, then I'll shift into a little bit of where it sits in the data journey. So I'll talk about what I what I see as the data journey and the, introduce this idea of exploratory versus explanatory data visualizations and why there might be a distinction between the two that some of you may not be aware of. It certainly um, was only something that I kind of really um, crystallized um, in recent years um, and also why it's so important to us. Um, and that leads into this sort of uh, UX user centric design um, topic of designing for our audience. So this is really, you know, our, where that um, UX stuff kind of, and they, I found such an overlap actually between uh, user experience and data visualization that it's kind of worth uh, talking that through. And depending on time, because I know we start a little bit uh, later than, than uh, scheduled, I might skip over this, but um, there's a little bit of a, a useful trifecta that um, I can share that sort of good way of checking in on whether a, a, a visualization is really working. So why is it that we visualize data? Now, some of you may have seen this. This is called Anscombe's Quartet. Um, and uh, this, uh, I think, is a statistician basically put together this uh, series of um, uh, four series of numbers. So we've got pairs of X, Y um, values across four different series, series A, B, C, and D. Um, and what's kind of fascinating about them is that although glancing at the table it would look like that all those numbers look uh, fairly different they actually all have the same basic descriptive statistics so if we were to just kind of describe them using in statistical terms many of the common things that we would do actually they come out looking exactly the same so they have the same mean of the x values so the average of the x values the same variance uh, the same mean of the y values the correlation value is the same um, and they even stick to the same regression line. So just glancing at the table, nothing really um, stands out. But this is where I think is a great example of why data visualization is so powerful. Um, that it kind of hacks into the, um, the visual parts of our brains. And we're very visual uh, creatures, us humans. Um, I think, I, I don't know the exact number here, but it's something like over half of the, the neurons in the brain apparently are dedicated to processing of visual, um, you know, to visual processing. Um, and data visualization falls into, into part of that, it's sort of hacking into that part of the brain that makes us so good at looking for patterns in data, looking for things that stand out. And in this case, the very dry, boring um, tables of numbers, nothing really um, stands out to us. You could pour over and check in, you know, sort of see, take those um, values one at a time and eventually might start to notice the patterns. But when we plot these things out visually using these uh, scatter plots here, all of a sudden, something leaps out. Each shape is immediately apparent to us. We recognize and spot those patterns and some sort of story jumps out um, from each of those four different series, even though they all had the, the same basic descriptive statistics. So um, I think it's quite an interesting way to, to demonstrate that. Now, one of the things that happens and why, again, it's a, it's a very powerful tool for us as, uh, in terms of communication is that what our brains do when they see a visual image is they, they do, there's this thing that happens called pre-attentive processing, where our brain looks out for things that stand out, certain attributes that really jump out to us. Um, and it will do this subconsciously in a, you know, a fraction of a second in, um, in sort of milliseconds, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Now, there are a number of different attributes that, that our, our brains are, are key to look out for when we're sort of noticing things that stand out. Um, and for the purposes of data visualization, we've got them ranked here in terms of how useful they are and how measurable they are for us in, in terms of, you know, when we when we see not only do these things stand out, but by how much and how how accurately might we be able to discern the differences between them. Um, over on the left hand side, we've got those that are very, uh, they're really quite measurable. So things like line length and position of things, we notice when things are sort of further apart or um, when lines have different, uh, different lengths. In the middle, we've got some that are indicative. So things like area and orientation color intensity and so on um, we can broadly quantify those differences so we can sort of roughly see how you know one thing might be about twice as dark as another but it's harder for us to make an accurate comparison um, and over on the right hand side you've got those pre-attentive attributes that really are just there to draw attention so you know it's hard to say how much more square is a circle than a triangle you know that it, it's hard to make that quantif quantification um, potentially almost impossible but they are still useful uh, to us when it comes to designing and uh, communicating with with our data insights so with those in mind, and as I said, you know, there are some that really are just so much better. And there's a whole reason why. I mean, it's quite funny how often when I'm asked to recommend a, a visualization, usually the, the safest play is to just say, make it a bar chart. And the reason for that is because that, that you know, line length is such a, um, a good measurable thing for us to use. So um, many of these attributes you'll see turn up in visualizations. And to give you an example, and I'm not suggesting that um, bubble charts as I've got plotted here and this is a very sort of illustrative um, um, uh, less than it's not a, a particularly well crafted bubble chart in that it doesn't have things like a title or a source and, and so on but just for illustrative purposes what I've done is I've mapped three uh, metrics over in the table in the left hand side so we've got a, a small table here with what six products in it um, and we've got uh, a couple of metrics or three metrics, customers, average price, sales value. And the sort of thing that we might look to do if we're um, looking to turn this into a visualization is we apply some encoding of that data using these visual, visual attributes. So those pre-attentive attributes that um, I mentioned on the on the previous slide, are the sort of things that we do, um, we, are, we utilize in encoding the data. So in this case, I'm, I'm actually plotting out all three of those metrics at once, those three dimensions, should I say, um, using uh, various attributes. So the customers essentially represent how far to the left or right or how, you know, where it sits horizontally. Um, so it's utilizing 2D position, the further over to the right, the more, you know, the larger the customer value. Um, average price is on the vertical axis. So that's another 2D position, how high or low a value is determines where that circle is going to get plotted and in this case i've added the third dimension which is the the area so the circle size is representing uh the sales value so three metrics all utilizing um, various pre-attentive attributes to demonstrate and encode that data and even though it may not be particularly uh, accurate and you know as i said there's no scale on here or anything but um hopefully it demonstrates again where you've got a fairly sort of drab table of numbers on the left hand side whereas on the right hand side very quickly we can see get a sense of which has the biggest sales value i.e the air at circle size it's number uh it's product b or you know which has the the largest um number of customers that's e the second one will be a you know these things are very quick for us to um to identify because of the whole pre-attentive attribute thing um one word on area. So this is, I'm going to have a quick word on pie charts. Pie charts are very controversial, uh, depending on how much you've followed in the, the world of data visualization. Um, the data vis purists will um, condemn them um, entirely, that they should never, ever be used. Um, and I'll, I'll explain the reason for that uh, in a moment. I personally, I'm a little bit softer on them. I'm one of the uh, one of the um, few data visitors, I think, who who kind of I'm not completely, uh, you know, it, there's no full sort of boycott or embargo on on pie charts as far as I'm concerned, because they're part of everyone's lexicon. There's there aren't really um, 
any other charts that demonstrate immediately that these things all add up should add up to 100 or they you know they add up to they're representing proportions of the whole data set but the reason why people are are really anti them is i've got these three pie charts here they're subtly different but it doesn't really jump out to us exactly why they are different because pie charts essentially use area to encode things and as we saw it's not the most uh, measurable of attributes Whereas if I was to plot the same data using bar charts, it's so much quicker and easier to see what you know the stories are in the data. So that's just a little uh, um, a little quick word on um, on pie charts and why we need to be careful with those. Um, like I said, I, I've never been fully hardline about them, but I know that you know many many people will recommend don't use don't use a, a pie chart, um, and that is why. So going into this idea of uh, exploratory and explanatory visualization, I, I thought I'd just do a quick talk through the data journey, which um, is, is very familiar to me and, and uh, as part of what I do working with the sort of grocery uh, customer data, uh, customer loyalty data. Um, this is the sort of thing that happens you know, every day, all the data that comes into the business, and I'm sure this is uh, common across many industries. Um, we start out up in the top left corner of the, the data journey here as uh, with data. So this is essentially just facts, things that happened in grocery data, that would be your till receipt, right? So I bought this product, I bought, I spent this much on it. This was the time that I shopped. This was where the shop was um, and so on. Those, those facts basically in and of themselves, they don't really mean too much. So that's where we start to process it. Uh, the data teams or whomever it is will turn that those facts into um, information the data gets turned into information those facts get given meaning by connecting you know we clean the data uh, we will code it we will connect things in usually in relational databases or whatever database technologies um, we'll, we'll create summaries we'll create lookup tables and we'll start to get an understanding of how all the data links links together we might be able to query for a given customer how often they've shopped or how much do they spend on a certain thing or what were the total sales in a given store you know th those kind of uh, those kind of pieces of information we can start drawing out which then of course leads us to the next stage of the journey which is asking questions of that data and looking for patterns and finding insights so that information starts to become useful when we can ask it meaningful business question so did my promotion strategy work did my uh, you know what uh, what new products should i create in this uh, in this category they're the sort of insights that we can then start drawing out of the uh, out of the data once uh, once it's been turned into information but it doesn't stop there for us because there is a, a chance that those insights essentially you know they, they can be a so what or you know that's a nice to know but what should I do with that information? And, and really the, the final part of the, the data journey is making recommendations of it. We, we often use the term actionable insights. It's, you know, that, that's essentially what we're doing there. Making recommendations to a client, for example, is the sort of thing that we might do. Um, now, the reason I present that is to use that as a framework to separate out the two modes of data visualization that I, um, I've identified. So the first is when we're working on this uh, asking questions of the data, when we're you know, looking to find answers. So I might go and run a whole lot of uh, data queries or um, you know, play with a, a data cube or run some uh, reports and so on. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm trying to find insights, trying to answer questions and turn that information, the summarized info, summarized data and pull answers from it. So I'm gonna be exploring the data. And as I mentioned, data visualization is a very powerful tool to help us find those patterns. Um, and so what I'll be doing is I'll often be creating uh, visualizations. You know, I might pull a giant table of numbers, build a giant Excel spreadsheet um, uh, or, or, you know, whatever it is. But then I'll likely be throwing it into some visualizations to see if I can find answers, see if some patterns and insights jump out at me. But at that point, our visualizations that we've probably made for ourselves are there for us to find those answers. They're often interactive. We might need to play with sliders and drop downs and change parameters, add, remove metrics and so on. Um, they're more likely to be complex. Um, I've got plenty of time to, to kind of um, just add lots of 
lots of data in there and to pour over it looking for those answers. And, uh, you know, we may need them to be multidimensional. We may need lots of metrics in there so that we know that we've covered all the angles and we're, you know, we're not, not missing something important. So at that point, it doesn't matter if I've got a lot of complex data, it's very interactive and, um, and uh, you know, multidimensional. But then once I move into this making recommendations, once I found the answers in that, that exploratory visualization and data set, I then move into a more of a communication mode. I'm then probably wanting to pass on my findings. I'm making some sort of statement. I want to show the evidence that I've found in the data. And at that point, the visualizations that I create and use should be much more um, focused. They're likely to be much more static. It might be, turn up in a presentation or in a, a blog post or um, you know a, a Twitter post, wh whatever it, wherever it turns up. It's likely to be need to be much simpler, much more focused. Probably self-explanatory if people are going to take it and pass that information on to others. Um, and it should be making a statement and really um, explaining what is happening, what the answer is, and. That, that, that was quite, a, quite an interesting and, and sort of stark realization that I often found when I was um, finding those insights, finding answers in the data that I would, the visualization that I used for that was often then repurposed to then explain it to somebody else. And, uh, and then you get into the realm of them looking at this complex multidimensional visualization, trying to draw and extract meaning from it. But really what I should have done is simplified it down into a much more uh, focused explanatory visual that really drives home this is the answer to the question. Now to bring that to life um, I thought I'd just uh, show you a couple of examples. This is one of my uh, one of my favorite visuals actually, uh, favorite data visualizations. It's what's called a, a small multiple chart uh, and in this case what you've got is um, as you can see all of the um, letters of the English um, alphabet um, or in the English language with distributions showing whereabouts they sit in uh, in a given word. So uh, just taking that that top left example, the letter A never very rarely finishes a word, but generally um, can be found in the, it's more likely to, to be sort of found in the middle um, and at the beginning. But then you compare that, compare that to say the letter R um, and it's much more likely to kind of be found in the, the tail end of words. Um, and the color, coding here is important as well. So we've got an extra dimension. So another, I mentioned multiple dimensions. We've got the color of the, each of those charts is representing how often they, they turn up in the English language. So that's the sort of Scrabble scoring um, idea. You know, your letters E, T, N, you know, the vowels and O, uh, sorry, the vowels and E and T, S and R, much more common than your, um, you know, the, the Zs and Qs and so on. Um, so multiple dimensions, and it's what what is kind of fascinating. I think about this visual and why I love it so much is every time I look at it and talk about it, I find new answers in it. So it's a great way to explore, and you could ask questions of it, such as, you know, which letters most are most likely to be found at the end of uh, a word, or more likely to be found at the the end than at the beginning, and so on. Um, so lots of different questions that can be asked of it, and that to me signals that this is an exploratory visualization. Whereas if I was to contrast that with um, this visual I found on Beautiful News, which is a great little website um, where they share sort of daily updates of nice, nice positive stories, this is a much more focused and explanatory visual. There's still a little bit of uh, kind of contextual stuff going on there, some additional metrics that didn't necessarily need to be there, but it's much more focused on telling its story. It makes a statement, it starts out by actually drawing it, you know, as often a clue is, does the, does the slide or does the visualization have a, a statement as part of its title? That can be a clue as to whether you're in exploratory or an explanatory visual. Um, and, you know, we can see here that um, there's much less to it much less complicated um, and it's really sort of focused on explaining some fact or some evidence that's found in the data and, and so on. So hopefully that is a, um, a, gives you a, a sense of what I mean by this sort of exploratory visualization mode versus an explanatory or I've heard it as uh, referred to as declarative, I think, um, way of presenting your visualizations. And I guess the, um, the, the takeaway from that would be when 
when one is putting together a, a data visualization just to sense check is this actually explaining and focused on um, answering the question um, or is it something that's probably being used to actually explore and look for answers and is is that fit for purpose which is the right right uh, kind of level of um, exploration that we want to be present in our visualizations so in terms of um and and i guess that would that leads us to uh, that that idea of what is fit for purpose what is the right uh, level of detail what is the right type of uh, data visualization to be presenting kind of um leads us into this idea of the sort of user experience user centric design and designing for our audience making sure we know who it is we're talking to what level of complexity we we need to be um, presenting to them and uh, i love this quote which is attributed to um to einstein i i guess often with these quotes did did they actually say it don't know but i'm, I'm happy to take the attribution uh, or pass the attribution on to him which is everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler and i think what i love about that is that although i I personally have a real drive towards sort of efficiency whether it's elegant design i don't want to over complicate my designs but there is a point at which you will go too far um, and by removing too much detail you might find that the, the visualization is completely worthless because you know there just isn't enough in it for it to actually answer the uh, the question that you're trying to answer with it and so here you know we've got an example of uh, on the left hand side the simplest kind of visualization uh, that you would expect to see on a, an Apple Watch in, in an activity track. This might be an old version of it. But um, here, you know, we, we're not after um, a lot of, you know, in depth, complicated um, uh, complexity here. You just want a quick heads up how what were my relative activity levels sort of thing and 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 the users are also less likely to be data savvy um, you need you know a much sort of broader audience whereas the visualization on the right is the sort of thing that you you'll probably uh, many of you will have worked on or, or or seen where the sort of things that will turn up in scientific papers now the sort of visuals that you'll put on and um, fit on a tiny weeny screen on, a, on an apple watch are not probably not appropriate to be um supporting a, a thesis in a um, uh, in a scientific paper but the the point being is you know there are there are there's an appropriate level of detail and it comes down to understanding who, who the audience is um, but with that said not only um, is it about making sure that we've got the right level of detail for our for our audience but also within that we can do uh, we we kind of there are things that we can do to to help everybody i think which is think the, the sort of design thinking idea making sure that we're paying attention to our um, information hierarchy or visual hierarchy uh, this um fairly uh, should, should look fairly familiar i guess to anyone who's who's flown on a plane the way that our um, boarding passes um, look it can sometimes be a bit impenetrable when it comes to immediately um, getting the insights that you want when you're looking at it you know where is my what's my seat or where what you know which gate th those kind of things and I think often they're not necessarily designed with the user in mind, they're designed for um, printability or to have you know, scannability or, or whatever it is for, for their systems. Um, and this actually forms, a, there was an interesting exercise that was done um, or that I, I believe is done fairly often when it comes to um, talking about and teaching design thinking. And that is to take that boarding pass and reimagine it, um, redesign it with that information hierarchy front of mind for making it as quick and easy for a, uh, for a user to scan and know, get that, that kind of key information. So all the information I believe is, uh, um, or the required information is presented, but it's just been given a different hierarchy and a different visual hierarchy as well to, um, to really help readers to, to see what's going on and i think that's true for um, our data visualizations as well and we can help that by um, utilizing um, th those sort of design thinking ideas of what is the what is the actual information um, that i really need to make sure is front and center you know we, I, I mentioned those visual brains we have earlier there are some things that we we um, absolutely key into when it comes to uh, you know we notice things like contrast um, and 
within our visualizations, we need to um, bear that in mind and we can use it to our advantage. So um, this idea of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an extreme one on the left is the sort of thing that Excel and various um, data tools might have created uh, 20 years ago or, or more. Um, thankfully, they've got a, a lot better in, in not having all these sort of um, distracting effects, all this, what is uh, charmingly referred to as chart junk. Um, and essentially what they are is, um, so this is the idea of the data to ink ratio. I think Edward Tufte uh, coined this phrase. Um, uh, sort of grandfather, I think, of modern data visualization. Um, and some of you, many of you may have heard his name. Um, and he had this idea that um, I think the, the mantra was above all else, show the data. Um, and that any pixel or dot of ink was either representing the data or not. And if it wasn't, then it was distracting from the, the message, sort of the sort of signal to noise um, idea. And because our eyes are drawn to contrast, we will just notice those uh, those bold lines, the heavy grid lines, the shadows, the bright colors, and so on. And, and our brain has to actually actively dismiss them and say, actually, this isn't presenting the information. This is kind of getting in the way of the information. And so we can get ahead of that when we're creating our visuals and making sure that the data is really front and center and your data pixels or data ink is um, vastly outweighing the non-data ink. So um, definitely something to bear in mind. And some of you may have seen this, this kind of thing before, but that visual hierarchy, what is it that's jumping out? I want the insight to really leap off the page. Um, I'm conscious that I'm we're probably at time, so um, I guess I won't uh, talk through the uh, elements of data visualization here, um, and probably just pause, you know, stop there, and and uh, and um, open things up to any questions that people might have. Um, so uh, yeah. Oops. Seems like there are no questions. I, I can't actually see the chat. So if there is any in the chat, no, then do I can't let me know. But the, I can't see any in the chat. So um... no worries. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess, Rachel, I'll, I'll just quickly wrap up then and just sort of go over what, what we just talked about. Um, so, you know, why do we visualize this data? We've seen that, um, you know, we look for patterns and things that stand out and we can use those pre-attentive attributes to encode our data into a visual form. Um, exploratory versus explanatory visualizations you know making sure that we're aware of the difference between those two and potentially you know when we're putting to, together a visual to explain and communicate to others is it actually an exploratory one that we used ourselves and we could maybe simplify it um you know i talked through the data journey designing for the audience making sure that you know the uh, complexity is right um decluttering to make sure that um, you know we draw the eye to what's important thinking about the visual hierarchy and that that insight leaps off the page uh, and then I obviously didn't uh, cover that um, message data visual stuff but um, it's uh, it really just sort of supports the other things I've spoken about if there, there. are so, if there are no further questions John um, we um, um, we could carry on till the till the end if everyone's happy going till uh, the top of the hour um, and then you get to, um, oh, we have a um, Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> we have one question. Um, should visualization avoid relying on color? Yeah, so um, that, that's an interesting one. I, I definitely don't go down the full route of only, you know, sort of um, only using pattern or making sure that everything has patterns and so on. Um, but contrast, I guess, so a useful sense check is, is uh, I guess, if it was printed in black and white or viewed on a black and white screen, would it, would it still stand up? Um, obviously, for accessibility reasons, well, actually, regardless of accessibility reasons, the very first uh, guidance I would always say is that if you're going to use color, use it minimally and with purpose. So because most people do um, are able to discern color, I think the, the incidents are, um, I think for color vision deficiency, it's something like one in um, one in eight men, I think, 
um, are affected, or it's either one in eight or one in 12. I always see the 12% or 8% and the, the inverse. It, it, but sort of broadly one in 10, one in 12 um, men are affected by some degree of color vision deficiency. And it's like one in 200 women, um, I believe. I think it, and it varies culturally and across, across the globe, but they're the sort of numbers that we're talking about. And red, green color deficient, color deficiency being the uh, the most commonly occurring within that uh, within that group um, but it's also it always strikes me that however often I'll, I'll be consulting on a, on a visualization or a, a dashboard and because red and green are so commonly utilized in um, in financial reporting that there is an insistent and you know there is a convention that we use red green and so it, it's a bit of a tricky one I, I would generally say try not to avoid, uh, try, try not to rely on color alone. Um, so if uh, let's say a pie chart or a visual and you wanted to, uh, a bar chart and you wanted to draw attention to one particular bar that using contrast in support of color. So, you know, one might be slightly darker, one might be, might, might be slightly lighter, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say to avoid using color because it is one of those pre-attentive attributes that we, um we do notice very quickly um and and i guess there's there can be a trade-off if you're using say patterns and and so on that that might just create a bit of visual noise um and that might just that might actually lean into the aesthetics debate which is uh if we've got another hour we can <laughs> we can go into that one but um hopefully that's answered it, it i think the the general rule of thumb i would go for and what i always aim for is to use color minimally and with purpose if I, I've seen many visuals where people, and you've probably worked on Excel spreadsheets that are covered in bright colors and, and it's just, you know, you, you feel like you want to put sunglasses on when you look at it. Um, and that actually, because our brains are so always looking for patterns, as soon as we see different colors being represented, we, we're actually asking our readers to interpret, is there a relationship between these colors? Why do the, why is that, that color? Why is this element a different color? Um, and so if I'm going to be using color, it's because I'm actually wanting to draw attention or make a point, make a connection um, within that visual. So hopefully that's, that's answered that from my point of view anyway. Great. Um, were there any more questions? I do have a request to uh, see the rest of the slides as we've uh, as we've got time for that. So. Um, okay, I'll, we're happy I'll to just carry on, Jen, no, yeah, yeah, no. absolutely. I'll I'll just uh, I'll, I'll just go over this one and it and introduce as a um, so this one is absolutely um, from taken from a website called Junk Charts, which is. Um, it's a bit of fun. It's a website where, um, uh, or a blog, um, where somebody gets sent examples of terrible data visualization. Um, and rather than it just be a kind of snidey, let's poke fun at this, um, at this silly visual, um, it's actually quite instructive um, and informative because they do a deconstruction and say how it's all well and good, this, you know, terrible visualization, um, let's all laugh at it, but actually in all seriousness, how should it, or what, what did they get wrong and what would we have done differently? So it's actually a very useful resource in that regard. And as part of uh, what they do, um, they came up with a, what they call their trifecta. And I think it's quite an interesting and useful way to um, review our visualizations. It could be a, a little check step of, you know, does, does this make sense as a visual that I'm presenting? And that is this idea that um, there are three elements to a, to a visualization, one being what the message is. So what is the story? What's the statement you're making? What's the answer to the, to, to the business question? Or what, it, what even is the meaningful um, business question that we're, um, that we're actually presenting some communication about? Um, then there's the data element. So, you know, clearly we're presenting data as part of this data visualization. Um, and within that, those, that data should be in support of the message so the, the answer that we're presenting as, as as part of our statement should we should have evidence within the data to support that um, and then the, the final element is the uh, the actual visual element so you know the encoding and mapping to visual attributes making lines or area or color whatever it is that we're um, we're using visually um, sort of pictorially to present that data and they should line up so the, the visual should 
be used to communicate the message so it should actually be in in accordance with the message and uh, that sounds um it's, it sounds like you know well isn't that always the case but it, it's quite often i'll have some statement um in a title i'll, I'll encounter at the top of a slide or a top of a visual and the visual itself seems to be saying complete something completely different um so you know that sometimes you'll get that disconnect but also the data should be um truthfully represented by the visual and you know often chart fails will come about when somebody has distorted the the scaling of an axis for example or really drawn your attention to something um that, that kind of misrepresents the data so the visual should should represent the the data truthfully and there's a whole aspect of um uh, journalistic integrity when it comes to that idea you know what should my axis scaling should be can i you can um, you know, the whole lies, damn lies and statistics thing, you can present your data to look like it's flat, or you can look, make it, you know, stretch the axis to make it look like your sales are, are soaring or, or whatever. Um, so there's an element to that. But, you know, the advice being just truthfully represent the data using your visual. And just as a bit of fun, this was an example um, from a, this is from a site called um, Spurious Correlations, um, that seems to suggest um, the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in over a certain period of time. You know, we've got our um, line chart here showing uh, mapping out the, the drownings and the, uh, the number of Nicolas Cage films and that there would appear to the, the viewer, the reader to that there is some sort of correlation between the two. Now, clearly, correlation and causation are, um, uh, are not not the same thing so um it, that's what makes this this website kind of a, kind of amusing because they find these odd um apparent correlations but they of course there's no um, connection between them but why it's an interesting little um uh we, we can apply this trifecta to it um to see why it why it actually fails um and i would say in this case that um there so we in terms of message state um data and visuals <clears throat> so it would appear that okay there is there is a message here now whether it's a useful message or not is 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 uh, clearly debatable but there is some sort of statement so they're definitely saying there's a message here which is nicholas cage is causing people to to drown or there is a connection or there is a, at least a correlation between nicholas cage films and people falling into into pools um and the visuals would appear to support that so you know the the way that they've lined these um lined these these uh, lines up you can see that when one goes down when one goes up when there's a peak when, you know the general trend and so on and so the visuals appear to support that statement about the correlation so kind of seems okay at that point again maybe a little bit um questionable but i think you know as a visual to say look these two things are correlated using a line chart when you're um you know representing two things happening over time it is actually quite a useful way to to demonstrate some sort of um, correlation of how, how these two events seem to be correlated. Um, now, where it, of course, where it falls over is the idea that there is actually evidence in the data to support that message. So, you know, we, we've pulled two, they've, they've pulled two kind of um, seemingly random um, data points, uh, data series and map them up to make it look as if there is a correlation. I would, I'm sure any statistician would say that is not evidence that uh, these things are uh, in any way connected. Um, and the, the last one and why I've put it as a question mark, this idea of do the visuals actually represent the data truthfully? Yes and no, and I, I would actually say, so if you notice the, the axis scaling here is quite interesting. So on the, um, the swimming pool drownings, they've scaled it such that the, the minimum is 80, the maximum is 140. They've, they've, they've set that axis scaling such that those lines overlap. Um, and it seems like a slightly odd choice, but you know, that's, that's clearly, um, it's been done there purely to make these lines line, uh, the, the, the two lines line up. Um, and so is it truthfully representing, um, representing the data? again yes and no but i think um hopefully that that sort of demonstrates that general idea of that a visualization is comprised of a message some sort of statement you know what it this is you know particularly if you're uh, thinking in terms of an explanatory or de 
declarative visual, um, you're making some sort of point or sharing some evidence that you found in the data, there is some message as a meaningful business question that's being that's being answered, that there is data to support that message and that data should be represented um, truthfully in a visual. Um, and those things, those things, those three things should all line up ideally. So there you go. That, that was the, uh, they were the two that I was, uh, uh, I obviously was going to skip. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Let's, um, with five minutes to go, um, let's call it there, I think. Um, obviously, we can, we can share slides and the recording afterwards. I'm just going to stop the recording now.